Hello, my friends. My name is Darren Gertis. I'm just a professor trying to provide you with some context in the war in Ukraine. If you're looking for Ukraine war news, I do this every morning, and then I do three big stories in the evening. Okay, we're going to start in a different place than where we normally start. This is Anton Gurashenko. Instead of a thousand words, Ukrainian Fashion Week. That's the reality for Ukrainians. And I want to start with that because everything that you see here, I want you to take back to this picture here. Okay, let's talk about the losses of the Russians. 1,200 Russians off the battlefield, six tanks, 21 armored fighting vehicles, 31 artillery systems, 37 vehicles and fuel tanks. Andrew Perpetua doesn't have his list out yet, but I'm going to talk about a comment of his after we talk about the numbers. So the daily numbers. This is the British intelligence update. The average daily Russian casualties killed and wounded in Ukraine has increased in August to 20, uh, 2024 to 1,187 per day. Now, that's 610,000 casualties killed and wounded um, since the war began. That's two and a half years of war, 600,000 casualties. But I calculated well, yesterday or the day before, at the rate that they're going presently with this, like, 1100 1200 whatever it is a day they're going to be at a million casual well okay the caveat here is if they keep at this constant rate of what the high rate of casualties is right now they would be at a million casualties by this time next year right now that's on top of so that's on top of the 610 so that's another 400,000 ish after 610 and two and a half years, which shows you that the, the rate has ramped up significantly in the last few months. Okay. Andrew Perpetua talks about how the number of videos over the past three days has been stupid. We averaged like 160 over the past two weeks. So the what he's tracking with vehicle losses and things along those lines, it's just, it's hard to keep up because there's so much damage. Uh, it just... <laughs> It is just so hard to catch up once you are behind. I feel you. I understand. That's exactly right. Especially this week, which was the worst possible week to fall behind. So it's pretty intense on the battlefield, and you'll understand that in just a moment. Ukraine repels massive drone attacks. 60 of 78 drones shot down across the country. 15 crashed. Three returned to Russia. And Belarus, uh, yeah, Belarus actually shot down two. <laughs> and they omitted, now they put out a statement, but they omitted mentioning that they were Russian. I'll show you the statement in just a moment. There were explosions in Belarusian Homel this night. According to monitoring channels, the air defense forces shot down the Russian UAV Shahid, which came from Cherniev region. The footage published by eyewitnesses shows a downed flaming object. It also claimed that the Belarusian Air Force raised fighter jets into the air to intercept the drones. Here's the official statement, quote, tonight, September 5, a fact of violation of the state border of the Republic of Belarus in the airspace, presumably by unmanned aerial vehicles, was recorded. A decision was made to destroy it. Timely actions of the on-duty air defense forces destroyed all the targets of the intruders. A check is being conducted on this fact. That was a statement. No mention that they were Russian. It sounds almost ominous like it was Ukrainian. But, of course, this is Darth Putin, the parody website. Belarus has dramatically escalated the situation with Russia by doing what the West is afraid to do. That's how it works. Okay. Um, let's talk about the hot spots around Ukraine. Death toll in... Um, Death toll in Russia's September 3 missile attack on Poltava rises to 54. I'm surprised that it hasn't risen higher given what we knew about the destruction and damage. It rises to 54 with nearly 300 injured. Now that number went from like 180 to 300, the number of injured. Um, okay, and so it's actually 297 people uh, were injured or suffered other trauma during the attack. So... Yeah, that's that's significant. Now, why did it happen like it did? Zelensky put out this in a in an interview. Russian missiles took three minutes to hit Poltava. So if there was somebody on the ground informing, saying, hey, there's this group here, there's, you know, like initial reports where there was a formation outside. It turns out that that's not true. People were just out walking or moving around or uh, whatever. But they knew where the site was. It only took three minutes to hit the place. 
Okay, let's talk about this. Uh, this morning, Russian troops dropped two guided bombs on the town and shelled it with artillery. The head of Donetsk Regional Military Administration said this was in Konsta uh, Konstantinivka. 24 private houses, an enterprise, three power lines damaged. Private houses. So at what point do you say, you know what, enough's enough. We're going to empower Ukraine to use these weapons in Russia to stop because they're just wantonly violating the rules of war by targeting civilians. Okay, a Russian drone deliberately hit a fire truck in the Dnipro. Again, at what point do you say, you know, enough's enough. Prior to that, Russia attacked the city's uh, civilian infrastructure. Then Russians waited until rescuers arrived to conduct a second strike. That's called a double tap. This is not the first time Russia deliberately attacks Ukrainian rescuers and infrastructure. About what's happening in Kherson right now, Russians are deliberately hunting, listen to this, with drones, hunting civilians. Over the past two months, life in the city has changed a lot. The city is under daily and nightly artillery shelling, the damage from which is measured in dozens of buildings and human lives. We know that that's been going on, but for two months now, the Russians have been massively attacking the city with grenade drops from FPV drones. If earlier the Russians targeted military personnel and military vehicles, now they are attacking civilians on a daily basis. Russian drone operators are deliberately dropping grenades on civilians, on women, on the elderly. Over the past two months, a large number of people have been killed who were just standing in line at the bus stop or getting off a minibus or shopping or whatever. I mean, it's at what point do you say this needs to stop? And so you've changed the rules, so we're changing the rules. So this is Dmitry Peskov, and he's saying the special military operation should continue until the goals are achieved because neither the United States nor European states nor Ukraine are inclined to a political and diplomatic means. So he says, quote, after all, the special military operation is an extreme solution, an extreme measure that was applied after the countries of the collective West and Ukraine rejected any proposals for dialogue. What he means by that is that Ukraine's rejected the idea of being a puppet regime of Russia. Next, Jay and Kiev talking about Putin's terror coalition expands. So I, I'm not sure that that's quite right. I think Putin might think that way, but I don't think that this is actually what's in fact happening. The prime minister of Malaysia said that the country is ready to join the BRICS and strengthen cooperation with member countries. Okay, earlier Turkey expressed desire to join the BRICS. So is that so the BRICS are an economic trading block. They just want to trade more. Now, Putin wants to be, you know, the master of this trading block and, and have this alternative to Western trade. I get that. But it's not really like you're building the Warsaw Pact again. It's an economic block. He doesn't want to be in any way involved in anything military. I mean, like, that's not his goal. So it's not quite a fair statement, but I get what Jay is saying. And I think Putin actually thinks it's more than what it is, but that's where we are. I don't think this is going to be anything meaningful in any way as far as the war is concerned. Okay, this is Steven Rosenberg from the BBC. Vladimir Putin has just publicly backed Kamala Harris in the U.S. election. Okay, so you would think, does, she, does he really want Kamala? But... And it's a big but. So this is commentary. This is, in fact, just, just remember, this is someone's perspective. The Kremlin will know very well these days any public endorsement by Moscow for a U.S. presidential candidate will do that candidate no favors in an election, which is probably why it previously backed Joe Biden and now Kamala Harris. Well, OK, may, maybe that's it. I mean, we just we don't know. We're speculating. You Tell me what you think in the comments below, because. I don't know. That could very well be. Now, Republicans are going to run with that and say, see, there he's afraid of Trump. There are some Republicans that will legitimately think that. Others will think what he's saying and go, you know, it's very possible. So put it in the comments below. So let's end with this. Ukraine's heroes, a developer, a landscape architect, a pastry chef, football club dynamo, Kiev player, farmer and biochemist, tech lead, big data engineer, and lead big data engineer. Well, yeah, but they're fighting because they have to, because they're defending their country and their homes and their wives and family. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the likes, the shares, and the subscribes. And thank you for being the kind of person that cares about Ukraine.